Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here to present uh, to you Philippine Aquaculture, the present, the future, challenges, and some strategies. Uh, we have here disclaimer, mention of product names, brands or companies or industry players does not mean an endorsement of brands or company and industry practices, nor does it equate to a negative view of the same. Next slide, please. Philippine Aquaculture performance for the past year's volume and value, import and export. Now, first, what is aquaculture? Aquaculture, less commonly known as aquaculture, is aqua farming. It is a controlled cultivation of aquatic organisms like fish, crustaceans, mollusks, algae, and other organisms of value. Now, why do we go into aquaculture? Given that overfishing of oceans and other natural resources is continuously increasing, humans need alternate sources for seafood to feed the planet's ever growing. Population. Now, why aquaculture again? Here are some of the observations. Regarding high, use, high land use requirements, aquaculture requires only moderate land use requirement compared to agriculture, which requires heavy usage of land and therefore competes with housing, manufacturing, and other land uses. Regarding freshwater usage, aquaculture re requires only moderate use of freshwater resources compared to agriculture, which is totally dependent on freshwater resources, and also competes with human consumption and wash requirements. In feed consumption, aquaculture animals normally have a low FCR compared to agriculture products like cattle, which require a high FCR of 6.1. Investment for both agriculture and aquaculture is both high, and this is essentially a private sector equity. Now, regarding risk for natural resources and climate change impacts, of course, both aquaculture and agriculture are prone to high risk of natural disasters and climate change impacts. Next slide, please. Now, here are some legislations protecting aquaculture. Uh, you can go over them, and if you intend to really go into aquaculture, you need to be practical and be uh, well acquainted with these laws. Now we go pro to production and value of the industry. The fisheries industry contributed to the economy in 2019 covered only 16.5% out of 100,000, 100%. Agriculture was 47%, which is essentially plants. Livestock covered 11%, poultry was 12%. Agriculture activities 8%, forestry was 0.6, while fishing including aquaculture, was 16.5%. Now, we can break down the sectors of the fisheries uh, sector into commercial, municipal, and aquaculture. To better get away, uh, what you call this <clears throat> perspective of the breakdown, uh, you can see this pie chart, the blue chart, the light blue field covers 50%, almost 50%. That is uh, crops, while the orange orange slice is the contribution of fisheries to the whole uh, GB in aquaculture by industry group. In 2019, aquacult the volume of aquaculture, a total volume of fisheries was 4,415 metric tons, of which 53% was aquaculture. 26% was municipal fisheries, and only 21% was contributed by commercial fisheries. Uh, in percentage, that was 41% for aquaculture, 35% for commercial fisheries, and 22%, sorry, 35% for municipal fisheries, and 22% for commercial fisheries. In 2019 and 2020, uh, value for aquaculture was 28%. Total value for fisheries was 281.652 billion pesos, 42% of which was aquaculture, 36% uh, of which was municipal fisheries, and 25% of which was commercial fisheries. In 2020, that was more or less the same with aquaculture contributing 53%. This is in terms of volume. Municipal fisheries, 25%, and commercial fisheries, 22%. Now, regarding the balance of trade in 2019 and 2020, we imported 
264,245 metric tons of fishery products. While we, I'm sorry, exported, while we imported 506,192 metric tons of fishery products for a negative uh, balance of uh, 241,938 tons of uh, fishery products. In 2020, that has changed more or less by we really exported 261,495 metric tons while importing only 405,574. Still a negative balance of trade of negative 144,075. Now in terms of uh, percentages for 2020, percent total back culture was 41%. Percent total, total of municipal fisheries was 22%. And commercial fisheries improved to 30, 35.84%. Now, if we break down the contribution of uh, aquaculture, you will notice here in this pie chart that bulk of uh, aquaculture uh, contribution to the economy was by seaweeds, which was 65%. Milkfish was 18%. Tilapia was 11.79%. And shrimps contributed 3.15%. In terms of uh, share, despite this, however, the Philippines remain to be the number 11 producer of fish, crustaceans, mollusks by, by principal producers in the year 2019. Now, the FAO has also noted the efforts of the Philippines regarding fisheries. In its country brief, it noted that uh, the Philippines per capita consumption was 26.2 per capita, which means every Filipino for one year ate the equivalent of 26.2 kilos of fish that included fresh fish, all presentations, dried, smoked, canned. It also noted that we imported uh, items such as tuna, yellow pin, uh, mackerel, malas, catfish, which is essentially uh, uh, gaseous shrimps and uh, two shrimps and yellowfin tuna. In the same vein, we also exported the same items. We exported tuna. Ex we exported shrimp. We exported the uh, yellowfin tuna, and but we added crab and other products to our exports. Now, if you if you ask, why do we import the things that we export? Well, that's a good question because. We import, for instance, the European tuna. We import fresh European tuna, process the European tuna, and, re -ex and export it to countries which we have commitments to supply. The same with shrimp. We import shrimp, but also export shrimp, which means we get the cheaper shrimp for our own consumption and send out our better shrimp, not necessarily better shrimp, it's the same shrimp, bigger sizes, to countries that uh, buy our shrimp uh, because uh, many of them prefer certain varieties of shrimp that we produce here in the Philippines. Now regarding aquaculture imports, what do we import? We import feeds, we import milkfish fry, we import SPF banana in broodstock, monodon broodstock, hatchery feeds, and equipment, machinery. We import live and ornamental fish. Occasionally, we import tilapia fillet, even milkfish for canning. We import small size shrimps for condiments. And occasionally, we do import large shrimp for seasonal demand. <coughs> Here is a comparison of the volume and the value of the imports of some items that we do import. You can just uh, look at the figures. And here are also some of our exports. Now we export to the US, the EU, many countries in the EU. We export to the Middle East, Australia, and other countries in the Pacific. Now these are some of the items which we export. Live grubs, live eel, live grouper, live tilapia, dried milkfish, dried seaweeds, and many other products.
Regarding investment in aquaculture, we can always divide investment into land, land development structures and equipment, and of course, working capital. Now, acquisition of uh, land normally takes somewhere between 500,000 to 1 million per hectare, used to be, depending on where you are. Now, you can also lease or rent land. In our place, we call it Quintos. The lo lowest lease here is 15,000 per hectare. And uh, that depends on the development of the area. Now, for land development, we normally spend about 250 pesos per cubic meter. Now, if you're going to do uh, what you call this uh, development by heavy equipment, that would be more expensive but faster. Also, you need to put up uh, power and electrical access. Well, that can also be expensive. And then going to Structures and equipment, you need to buy cages, tents, pumps, hoses, aerators, boats, vehicles. And for working capital, you need to have money for fry, feed, salaries, and wages, as well as other inputs like seed, pea seed, probiotics, supplements, as well as uh, steps for biosecurity. Now, for land valuation, Baja Culture Peace Farms, here's uh, some examples. This farm is uh, located in Aklan, it's being sold for 7.8 million. And it's, it's just three hectares, so you can imagine how much this would be. Although, probably you can still negotiate to bring it down. Here is another farm in Bulacan. It's being rented out for 800,000 per year, probably is 10.5 hectares. And by the looks of it, this will require a lot of maintenance. Now, here is the investment summary and percentages. Uh, so you can see it. Anyway, you will have a copy of this uh, presentation. So we don't need to go through the figures. Now, in the impacts of storms, not normal weather, weather on aquaculture, uh, quote unquote, damage or destruction of aquaculture facilities lead to financial loss and profit potential for the owners and the fish farmers. However, the stocks like fish, shrimp, sea plants, however, they are not lost, but most of the time become common resources on code. Now, okay, we now proceed to our production goals for 2020 in terms of expansion, volume, import, and key production index. And what factors that might impact production goals? Now, I have deviated uh, from this uh, outline, but before uh, I explain why, let's go to the factors that may affect uh, achievement of production goals. Number one is the wars in Europe and other areas. Scarce supplies of feed wheat for animal feed millers. I used to work for a feed mill when I used to, when I, where I used to source uh, wheat, soya, and other feed requirements. Uh, some of the time we would buy from Ukraine, and now there's no feed wheat from Ukraine. Increased fuel cost impacting transportation logistics. Of course, if your fuel goes up, everything goes up. And depreciation of the peso versus the US dollar. This, however, will favor exporters. Number two, the stagnant or low lo local demand. There is an apparent surplus as indicated by low farm gate prices. Number three, the challenge of end threat of disease. Lack of the uh, diagnostic laboratories for particularly for shrimp growers, lack of general information protocol for the identification, prevention, and treatment of disease, again, particularly for uh, shrimp growers, lack of dry juveniles for grow out. This includes everything from milkfish, shrimp grower, lobster, and, other, and some fry taken from the wild. And number five, another thing that may affect you Next year would be the adoption of the National Code of Practice and Biosecurity Measures. Now, aquaculture essentially has been just the standard paradigm was produce and sell to buyers. And that was it. But in the current uh, scenario, you need to produce and sell what people is will consider safe to eat. It will have to have overall health benefits. It should be not destructive to the environment and not abusive to the people who produce the food. And lastly, giving consideration to the welfare and human treatment of organisms we use as food. Now, 
instead of one of the uh, items that I would like to highlight is the focus on marketing. Now, why is farm gate low and detail high? Well, I understand because I used to sell milkfish before. <coughs> the cost of the difference between retail, wholesale, and retail is number one, additional expense for transport. So that's understandable. Additional cost for hunting and ice, again, that's understandable. The freshness factor when the old fish is cheaper than you arrive fish. And the profit margin for players along the market chain. Uh, during the time I was doing selling, I noticed that there was a 20 peso difference from our consignation to the buyer. <coughs> the buyer will then charge, add 20 pesos to the middle, middleman, <coughs> which normally will buy only 100, 100 kilos, 200 kilos. And then this guy will take the 200 kilos, bring it to the market and sell it again and add another 20 pesos. And finally, it gets to the retail market, which we call the La Mesa. And the La Mesa will add another 20 pesos, maybe more, before the consumer gets it. Uh, this seems unfair, but I think uh, depending on where you stand, sometimes there are services that are not seen by the end users, which people like us farmers uh, get, what you might call this, uh, get the benefits. But of course, sometimes, uh, depending on where you stand, those benefits or those uh, margins might become very exorbitant. Now, this is from March 2022. We do track our prices. If you notice this one, yeah, March, March 5, the volume of fish there, or milk fish was just 125 tons. 125 tons is a small volume. And the price was for the two by one, which is our benchmark size. The price is 160. Uh, range between 160 and 140. Now you might ask why the difference from 160 goes to 140. When trading starts at 7 p.m. normally, that's a height of the price. Now, at about 12 p.m. or 12 midnight, when there are more stocks and less buyers, the price will tend to go down. That's what explains the range. Sometimes the other way around, if there are less fish and more buyers, the price will go up. In March 9, four days after, the price is still the same, despite that the volume was larger. Now, in the next uh, period, March 15, the price is still the same and the volume is still the same. As of that of March 5. Now, in August, this is still the same, but the price has gone down by 5 pesos. Even actually, the volume has gone down. In October, however, there were some events that uh, the rain season has come in. Fishing was a bit more uh, difficult, so the price went up to 175, despite the volume also being at 115. But uh, actually, that is a relatively small volume. In November, in November, early part of November, the price, the volume was just 94. But this was right after storm pain. So the prices went up because there was no fish in the market. In November 11, with a smaller volume, 75 tons, the prices benchmark was uh, 178. So that was impacted again, still impact of the typhoon, which destroyed a lot, of, which destroyed a lot of cages, yeah, and uh, of course let loose a, a lot of uh, bungos of different sizes, and the volume that time was the 75 tons. Now, 75 tons actually is small because when I was selling bangus, we could reach 200 tons per day and still it would be consumed. It was very rare for uh, bangus to be left unsold up to the following day. Now, here are some of the farms that uh, we made uh, a survey. Now, of course, 
these are the prices that we made. This is for export. Same 30 to 50 pieces per kilo was sold at uh, the equivalent of in euros, 18 euros. That's equivalent to 1,060 pesos. Now, Monodon or Tiger Prawn was sold at the equivalent of uh, 30 euros, which is 1,780 pesos. Now, the exchange rate is 1 euro to 59 pesos. Now, if you look at it closely, it appears that Monodon still has a more, uh, what you might call this, still has a market, niche market, which will uh, provide the demand despite despite the high price. Here is the before mon price monitor, but it's too small. I can no longer. Okay, so number three, moving forward. Uh, there is a renewed interest in self, quote unquote, self supporting species or species that do not require fertilizers or artificial pigs. Now, what are these? These are oysters and other bivalves, seaweeds, and uh, sea cucumbers and other echinoderms. Uh, work still has to be done on echinoderms and other and sea cucumbers. The, the next is intensification for current species like milkweed and shrimp, and probably uh, innovations in crab production like soft shell crabs. And talking to the market regarding species that they need and we can produce. Now, okay, why oyster? Oyster production is intended for oyster meat and oyster sauce production. Oyster production has already been stabilized, more or less, and the market is also stable. And here are the traditional ways of doing it. Some private sector entities, together with other government agencies, have done much research on this and uh, have assisted local growers on what to do to produce better. There is the technology of microcarts, the technology for single and segregating oyster spots. And of course, there is also uh, the technology of what we call remote setting. This involves putting your spot collectors in the hatcheries of the uh, spot producers and then letting the spots settle on your collectors before you bring them out in the field. The next is the soft shell crab. Well, with soft shell crab, we need to buy the crabs, uh, preferably 100 to 150 grams, bring it to your facility, wait for it to mold, feed it, and wait for it to mold, and that's it. Take it out, place it in fresh water, place it immediately. Here is a setup for the soft shell crab and soft shell crab boxes. And here, are, here is the end product, frozen self. Uh, soft shell crab and soft shell crab ready to cook. Here are prices of the, the, the current products that we often buy online and retail. Now, the aquaculture industry is also dependent on other industries. Now, what are these industries? These are the logistics and cold chain. Yeah, there's the uh, Cold chain, of course, uh, there's a shortage of cold chain facilities in the Philippines. That's probably one of the reasons why we have problems with our cold chain system. Uh, I mean, with our production, because we tend to keep them in the water longer than they should. Next is uh, logistics, trucking services, shipping services. And, of course, the people who do the processing for us, the people who are who harvest for us, and the people who sell the fish for us. Now, re regarding our observations, aquaculture will still, will of course be uh, profitable despite the challenges, but you will need to be more, uh, small call this, listen more and improve your techniques in order prediction and level up more intensive systems. Now, the, the improvement of current market systems and development of markets will have to be done. And the quote-unquote branding of Philippine aquaculture products should now be initiated. Now, how do we brand products? If you ask yourselves, when you say endox, that's, that means you're selling chicken. 
When you say KFC, that's chicken. When you say dagupan, you're referring to bangus, but how, much, how many people they, uh, really know dagupan? So we will need to find out or uh, find ways to improve marketing of our products. And also, I have no scientific basis for this, but we, I, I believe that a lot of the people below 20 do no longer eat fish like before. Now, the next is uh, integrated aquaculture production systems are more profitable and resilient compared to standalone operations. Now, this has been proven to be true. Big companies which have their own hatcheries, their feed mills, their grow facilities and processing facilities are more prone to be resilient and can survive more or less uh, climate change issues, should we say, compared to small growers, and uh, other uh, standalone systems. The lack of support facilities should be remedied. Now, we don't have facilities for hatcheries for disease prevention and control. And of course, cold chain facilities. It still remains a challenge of the industry and needs to be resolved. Now, there are also laws that pre prevent us from either exporting or importing or using some of our resources uh, in a manner that should be beneficial to us now. They should be reviewed and they should be uh, amended if possible. Now, one of these laws example is the, is the prohibition to export fry of, uh, of uh, shrimp. I think we can now export shrimp fry. And probably even, uh, well, we, we'll we just start with the fry first. <laughs> now, here are my industry references. Uh, I can just browse, browse the references. And that is, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>